You've been working on a, a little project uh, dealing with migraines. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we've been interested in been studying migraine for well almost thirty years now. Um, the different pathophysiology and the mechanisms that are involved in it, and then also what I've been really interested in is trying to discover, you know, anti migraine how anti migraine drugs work, and then more recently how nutraceutical might work because a lot of nutraceuticals contain chemicals that mimic you know, drug-like behaviors. And so then what you're looking for is, can you find a nutraceutical, something that you have you could use in your diet, right? That could actually help maybe give you the same benefit that you see by using a pharmaceutical. And the emphasis here is always on more on prevention than it is on treatment, if that makes sense. So that's a big distinguishing feature for me is that, you know, we have so many people that are, you know, going into migraine and stuff. And then we have pretty good abortive treatments, you know, things that can actually, once you start a migraine, we don't have as many things to actually help people avoid a migraine, you know? And so for me, I like the more natural approach of using your diet and lifestyle modifications to help, you know, just minimize your risk for even getting a migraine to begin with. Gotcha. And so what kind of, uh, what kind of foods should we be eating to, uh, to avoid migraines? Well, see, that's where, yeah, like you saw is what we've been working on. We, we have NIH funding in the, on grapeseed extract. So we've been working on that and that actually helps modulate the GABAergic system and helps with descending pain modulation. So it actually works kind of like an opiate type of drug, um, you know, to block pain signaling in the, in the spinal cord. And then the, the other stuff that we've looked at, it was uh, with chocolate, dark chocolate, cocoa, was basically um, finding that it actually contains this compound known as beta cytosterol, which is like a steroid drug. So when you basically consume dark chocolate in its more original form, which is cacao, right? So the closer you are to like the 90% or 100% actual cocoa, that actually is the best because that has the highest concentration of the beta cytosterol, which is this anti-inflammatory compound. And it's just for point of reference, it's the active ingredient in aloe vera. So you know how that's so anti-inflammatory and so the way that we look at it is by consuming dark chocolate on a regular basis. And again, this is not Hershey's chocolate or chocolate that has you know, been processed. That's really the distinguishing thing, right? So that, you know, we're talking about truly dark chocolate, the really bitter stuff. And then, you know, putting that into your diet for some people basically is going to be, uh, have an anti-inflammatory component to it. And we know that migraine has to do with inflammation so by, you know, consuming this on a regular basis, it's just not only going to protect your nervous system, but it also protects your cardiovascular system as well. Gotcha. So, I mean, how much, how much dark chocolate should we be having a, a day? Well, what they usually say is like what fits in the palm of your hand. And then you, I mean, from bigger studies that are on cardiovascular disease and such, they're saying to do that like about three times per week. So it's like, again, you don't have to do it every day, but you want to have a, you know, a kind of just in your diet on a regular basis. Um, there's they're high, the dark chocolate that's highly enriched in polyphenolic compounds, which are anti-inflammatory, but also they're considered as antioxidants. So we all know the benefit of like having vitamins, like vitamin C, vitamin E, all these different vitamins. Well, those vitamins work as antioxidants. And then the, you know, so that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to help boost, you know, the, the nervous system to, you know, actually maintain its health is really what we're trying to do. Gotcha. So this, this is both something that's preventative, but also something that if you're going through uh, a migraine, uh, any yeah. idea of how quickly uh, the, uh, <laughs> the process would be? Yeah, see, that, it's an interesting thing that my, my grandmother was, who got me interested in this way back when, would, because what she would do is when she started feeling a migraine coming on, she would get the Baker's dark chocolate, which is the, you know, the really the pure you know, cocoa liqueur, right? And then she would actually take a couple of squares of that and then just go lie down. And she would swear by it. And when I was traveling over in Spain, they said in the Spanish culture, they still do that. That they, you know, they have a reliance on cocoa for that reason. You know, that in some migraineurs, it actually helps get rid of their migraine. So like, you know, migraine is very complex. Um, so like even somebody taking even the best anti-migraine drug, it's only gonna work about 60% of the time. So we don't really have a magic bullet that hits works 100% of the time. I mean, think about even like your own headaches, your own things. Sometimes you take ibuprofen, it doesn't work as well as other times. 
Um, migraine nerves are even more complex in the sense that like a drug that works one time may not work on the next headache that they have. And so what we are always saying is, you know, for anybody, you have to just kind of try these things. And then if it actually helps you, then continue with it. If it doesn't, you know, that might be just how you metabolize it, um, if that makes sense. So that's the thing with all the different ethnic groups and stuff. We all have different enzymes. We all metabolize things differently, different foods. And so that's part of it as well. So you just, what I always tell people is that there's lots of choices out there as far as dietary choices that are, you know, things that are highly enriched in antioxidants and polyphenolic compounds. So like almost all of your superfoods, like your berries and things like that. Um, you probably know like the blueberries and all these other things that you hear about as superfoods that are, you know, really potent antioxidant. Any of those should be really good for you, you know, in the sense that they're going to help quiet the nervous system down and quiet inflammation down. So, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a, a observation and maybe it's just my, my own yeah. ignorance, but um, yeah. I, I've never, I've never experienced a migraine myself and yeah. a lot of people in my family haven't either. And mm -hmm. I've just kind of noticed for the most part, it seemed to be more of a female Caucasian kind of a thing. A am I correct to kind of, kind of have that assumption or? Yep. That's pretty much accurate. Yeah. I mean, um, Caucasian women are almost three times more likely than Caucasian men to have, you know, migraines. So yes, it's much more prevalent in women than in men. We always kind of look at the, you know, the, the, hormone differences and things like that. There's actually a type of migraine known as menstrual migraine. Um, but we also think just the nervous system of, you know, females and males is set up differently. And the other thing too, you have to keep in mind is that testosterone is a really good pain blocker. So, you know, when you think about athletes and stuff like that, especially male athletes and stuff, they have lots of testosterone. They can, that's why they can do those really physical sports. And, but they don't seem, they don't seem as susceptible to having migraine and such. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't truly understand, but there's again, a genetic component to all this. So if it runs in your family, you might just be one of those families that has people that are more hypervigilant. You probably know them, the type A personalities that are just really over the top on everything. They're stressed out. They just seem to be stressed out all the time because they're trying to control everything. Right. And then that actually, for me, migraine is kind of nature's way of saying shutting down. So I use the computer analogy. You get too many programs running, right? And they're multitasking all over the place, but they're sleep deprived. You know, they maybe haven't skipped a meal. Maybe they're dehydrated. All these things then become what we call the perfect storm. And then all of a sudden their body has a migraine and a migraine is nature's way of saying stop. So it's kind of like a hard boot for a computer. So you have all these programs running, all this energy that's going in, you know, it's running all these programs in your head, basically you're dealing with all this stuff. But then when you think about what migraine is, it makes you sensitive to light, to sound, to smells. It, you're not going to want to move. And all you really want to do is curl up in a fetal position and find a dark place to sleep. So I think it's just literally, that's how I look at it, is that like, so I look at migraine as kind of an evolutionary type of thing that basically within our populations, right, that these individuals might have been sentinels. They would have been the people to, that don't sleep as well, that are more you know, reactive to things, or they respond to things in the environment much more, um, I guess, sensitively than like maybe you or I would, somebody who doesn't get frequent migraines. So I think they just have a different um, uh, nervous system, right? It's set up to be more hypervigilant. And, but that's also very protective, right? So think about like, you know, having people within a migraine population or within a village, right? Where someone does smell, you know, the fire and does know when food is bad. And so for me, it's like kind of one of those evolutionary type of things that I think makes sense. So I, when I talk to migraineurs, I try to put it in within a biological context and put it more into a positive spin. But it's kind of like if you're familiar with like autism spectrum as well, um, kids on the autism spectrum, you really don't want to have a lot of moving objects and stuff. You don't want to have a lot of information coming into them because that's not what, how they, pro they like to focus, right? And be very myopic. So that's very stressful for them if things are changing too quickly. Okay, does that make sense? So they have a nervous system that, again, is very different than the average individual. Um, the migraineurs are the same way. They have to control their environment. So they, if, they're, if you are somebody who's more hyper-excitable, you're sensitive to storms and weather fronts and bright lights and changing, you just have to be more vigilant, right? Um, 
I, I use the same example if you have if low back pain runs in your family, right? So in other words, if you anatomically are just prone to have low back pain and running in your family, you just have to be more cautious, right? Like you really have to do make sure that you keep yourself stretched out, that you basically when you're lifting things, you use a really good form. Otherwise, if you don't, you're just going to be you're going to be chronically injuring your back, right? So for me, that's how I view the migraine picture. It's just it's just part of the spectrum of humanity. And I don't look at it as necessarily a negative thing. I just think it's, you just have to be more hypervigilant. You just have to be more aware of your environment and then control your environment so that you don't get overstimulated. Gotcha. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. But I mean, the problem is like, we, we live in an environment where stress is on an all time high, right? I mean, between social media, all the political stuff going on, everything that's going on, I mean, you know, people are stressed out, the climate change, you, you name it, right? So the, uh, being on a college campus, I see, you know, the stress in the kids on a regular basis, right? And how many of them are having to use like, you know, medications to control their anxiety and their depression. Um, you know, that number is just going up exponential right now. Um, and that kind of speaks to the whole thing that we're seeing within the migraine space, that there's more and more, even teenagers and stuff experiencing migraine. So it's becoming, I think, more prevalent rather than less prevalent now. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we covered quite a bit. Anything, <laughs> anything else I might have missed or anything else you want to talk about? I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, unless you have something. I mean, for me, it's like I said, I, I just look at it as that I think a lot of it has to, you have to almost give ownership to the migraine patient and they have to realize that they have to be responsible for their own care as well. I think too much in our culture, right? We tend to think like the medicines can fix everything. And I'm kind of more of a balanced person. I like thinking about what, you know, it's like Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. So he's the father of Western medicine. And I'm like thinking, you know, our ancestors basically relied more on what they were eating, right? Um, to help maintain a healthy immune system and a healthy nervous system, uh, that kind of thing. Um, like I know, like in the winter months, we used to front load more on vitamin C, right? Orange juice used to get pushed quite a bit and things like, so in other words, you just ate a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables on a regular basis because all of those are very nutritional. Um, so fruits will give you a lot of like the antioxidants and those kind of things and the things that actually help quiet your nervous system. But then the vegetables give you a lot of vitamins and minerals, which are also essential for like overall neuronal health. So for me, it's always comes down, like when you're going back to your question before, like what should you eat? To me, it's always kind of comes back to that, you know, eat as much, as many fruits and vegetables as you can. Um, another weird thing that um, we see within the migraine community is they're deficient in magnesium. And that's what you get from really dark leafy green vegetables because magnesium is actually one of those minerals that's used in chlorophyll, which is the pigment that, you know, plants use to capture sunlight, you know? And so that's what's kind of interesting, isn't it? So like if you eat really, I mean, so darker green vegetables have a lot more chlorophyll, but that also means they have a lot more magnesium. And there's a study that was saying that I think up to 40% of migraineurs are deficient in magnesium. So magnesium helps quiet the nervous system. Just like, you know, how like if you're low in iron, you feel kind of tired and sluggish. Um, that the same thing is kind of true with magnesium. If you don't have enough magnesium, you actually are more hyper excitable. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Kind of, magnesium kind of quiets the nervous system down, where if you don't have enough magnesium, you're a little bit more hyper excitable. And that kind of ties into that whole, you know, migraine phenotype. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like, uh, obviously, uh, you are what you eat. Yeah, well, to, I think I think that is very true. I've always kind of, I grew up in rural Illinois and stuff, and we, we still to this day have a huge garden. So my wife and I we, and our kids, we have always eaten a lot of food out of our own garden. Um, so that's always, you know, that's just the way we were raised and what we did. Um, and it actually tastes better. <laughs> so it's like, so that's another thing is just like, you know, um, I'm always big on not eating a lot of processed foods unless I, you know, unless I'm traveling or something where you have to, but um, you know, it's not necessarily our culture either. 